Welcome to The Relevance Report, where we explore the relevant stories that are shaping our world today. I'm Darby Crouch, your host this week. On today's show, we'll discuss impaired driving in Canada and changing legislation. We'll hear from an ETS bus driver about ensuring passenger safety in Edmonton. Then we'll be delving into technology advances in audio through Dolby Atmos. We'll also be discussing a teacher's perspective on changes in education today. Over the last five years, about 8,600 people have been convicted of impaired driving in Alberta. On average, one in five Albertans have been involved in collisions due to drunk driving. For more on this, I spoke with Corporal Troy Savinkoff to discuss the facts and see what is being done to bring down these convictions. We're going to talk about something that has been going on for many, many years, and it is impaired driving. So is there a pattern that you are seeing with these impaired driving charges? So impaired driving is the leading cause of criminal death in Canada and is every year. So that means more people are killed by impaired drivers than are murdered uh, in our country. And I can guarantee that year after year, the the stats are the same. And it's one of those offenses that for whatever reason, people think impaired driving is victimless, but the dead people, the injured people obviously prove different. Millions of dollars, lots of volunteer hours are put in trying to educate people on that fact that there is a victim, that there's a, an effect to the impaired driving. And yet we always see it. it uh, it's under constant combat. We know that if we can reduce the amount of impaired drivers on our road, it'll make our road safer. We know it'll save lives. And there's a, a percentage with that. If you can drop impaired driving on the road by 10%, you're going to save X amount of lives on the road. So it's a constant education campaign, enforcement campaign to try to prevent people from getting behind the wheel drunk. Well, speaking of enforcement, I know that the legislation has changed when it comes to charging the impaired drivers? So one of the struggles that police have when enforcing impaired driving is the fact that an impaired driving investigation takes an officer off the road for a significant period of time. There's the initial interaction on the road. There's then waiting for a tow truck. You then transport the suspect back to the detachment uh, where you're going to be dealing with that suspect for about an hour, having them provide breast samples, going through uh, arrest and release procedures. And even after they are released, um, there's a significant amount of time that is spent preparing the court documents to send that person to court. Uh, Not only that, uh, when you bring an impaired driver back to the detachment, you need a second officer uh, who actually is the one that takes breast samples from the suspect. And that takes about 45 minutes for that officer. So there's a significant period of time. Because of that, police at times can be less effective conducting uh, impaired driving enforcement. You know, the the, the most uh, typically an officer impaired that an officer can do in a day would be three in a night. And that would be getting, spending no time locating them. You're immediately locating them and you're processing. Uh, Keep in mind that we have our traffic officers that are dedicated 100% to those endeavors, but we also have uh, general duty police officers that do a lot of the impaired driving enforcement. These officers are tasked with additionally responding to calls while they have impaired driving investigations on the go. So it really is a time situation. Years ago, British Columbia uh, had this exact same plan where they would remove it out of the criminal courts and put it under provincial sanctions. And in 2020, Uh, the Alberta government instituted the IRS program, which is the Immediate Roadside Sanction Program. What that allows our officers to do is right there on the side of the road um, with two fails on the roadside screening device um, to immediately give uh, a driver an immediate one-year suspension of their license that they could get after after three months, they can get a interlock installed into their car. But essentially, it's one year with the ability to get your license back after a three-month uh, sanction, which is essentially the same as what they would kind of get through the criminal courts. The driver wouldn't get a criminal record. However, the first offense would be that, and the offense is... Uh, the sanctions that they get are, are more as they get more impaired. This allows the day-to-day impaired drivers to be able to be dealt with efficiently. Officers can stay on the road and be more effective going after more impaired drivers. If the suspect were to kill somebody or it was something more serious, the officers still have the ability to do what a traditional impaired driving investigation would be and take that person either back to the office or, if it was a serious enough collision, investigate them at the hospital. How effective do you think this change has been in cutting down these stats? Well, I think holding people accountable for their actions is extremely important. Like we've spoken about already, there's been a significant amount of education for people. They know they're not supposed to. So at that point, what do you have left? You have enforcement. Is there anything more that can be done maybe from a federal level 
or provincial level that can continue to help with that. Impaired drive investigations are an interesting situation because people in Canada are protected against unlawful searches and seizures. During impaired drive investigations, RCMP and all police have special laws that the government has created that really forces a person to provide a breast sample. If you don't do what we tell you to in those circumstances, you will be charged. So it's one of those caveats where your rights are being breached, but for a good reason. The laws are adapting to give police more powers. Defenses are in, you know, constant uh, new defenses that are coming up. And sometimes those defenses will, will hamper impaired drive convictions. It's it's a constant almost cat and mouse game with police and and, and lawyers and, and the government on, on how we prosecute these things. Our own Garrett Krizanowski sat down to talk with ETS bus driver Clayton Cadu to discuss what he does to ensure passenger safety in not only the winter months, but during the frigid cold snaps Edmonton has experienced this past month. What time of day are you usually doing your bus route? I've been an early morning guy for probably about 15, 20 years now. Uh, I start work at around 4.30 every day. Uh, finish out about quarter after 12, uh, Monday to Friday. Obviously, the city of Edmonton, there's been a lot of crime lately. Like it's mostly in public places. Obviously some aren't. What do you as a ETS bus driver do to kind of take that extra step to ensure the safety of your passengers? So that's a tricky question for me. If, like we just talked about my hours of work. So my hours of work, I don't really see a whole lot of what's going on with the city. Um, however, I do know like later in the day, or if I do sometimes work in the afternoon. I feel as though I'm a pretty good judge of character. So I just kind of keep an eye on, you know, if there is people that kind of just kind of come across a little bit differently, or if somebody does get on the bus a little bit more, you know, I always make sure I say hi and stuff to people just to kind of see what their reaction is going to be upon things. So if there is somebody that does get on and it's kind of, I, I, I feel like they're, they could be a little bit of a problem. I always will just kind of keep my eyes up, you know, um, in the mirror, looking back, just to making sure that everybody's okay. Uh, if things do start to get a little bit awry, you know, if a little bit of aggressiveness or something like that, I'll, I'll call control immediately downtown. Um, and, but for for the most part, to be honest, with the hours that I work and the routes that I work, and I always try to pick routes that I don't really kind of have to deal. I don't go downtown or anything like that. So I try my best to just kind of, you know. Not judge people, but just kind of keep an eye on, you know, situations on the bus. I'm always looking around, making sure I always know my surroundings and stuff like that. So obviously the seasons have a bit of an effect on your bus driving. What do you do differently or what is something that you have to do differently in the winter months as opposed to like the summer months and the spring months? Yeah, it's funny. There's kind of a, like an ongoing thing with, you know, transit drivers where there's only there's only two two types of seasons and it's uh, wintertime and construction season because that's about all we get. Anytime it is nice weather, there's construction. But, you know, the biggest difference is when it comes to the winter months, biggest thing you kind of got to watch out for is is the people in general, like. With, with the, I'm pretty confident when I am driving in the winter. Um, you're obviously paying a lot more attention to to the roads when they're a little bit slicker. You got to kind of got to watch everywhere, kind of have to keep your head on a swivel a little bit because you don't know, you know, kind of got to keep your eye on your mirrors because if somebody's going to slide in, in on top of you or into the back of you. And just in general, I just find when it comes to winter months, uh, people, it seems to be they want to get somewhere faster in the winter time. It seems I, you know what I mean? Compared to the dry months when the pavement's dry. <laughs> um, so yeah, just it's, and you got to kind of keep an eye on like situations when it comes to, you know, people waiting for a bus. So I'm always making sure that in the winter time, I kind of give it an extra, you know, a few seconds in case people are running for the bus or in case, cause you don't want to have people running for your bus and slipping. So I kind of, you know, sit back a little bit longer than I probably should just to make sure that everybody does get on. Cause I mean, that's the last thing you want to do is make people stand outside in the cold. So no, especially with the, the cold snap, we kind of saw a few weeks ago and I'm sure we'll probably come back because that's just how Alberta weather is. Do you do anything differently when it's like that really cold weather? Is there any other precautions or yeah, things? When, yeah. When it comes to that kind of cold that we recently just had a few weeks back, the one thing I did, I did go in a little bit earlier because I wanted to make sure that my coolant was full. That's the biggest thing. A lot of people think that in the wintertime, buses can just stop on on a dime. It doesn't work that way. I, you know, buses don't run on, we, we don't have winter tires. We have all seasons on. So especially with that cold that we just had, um, a lot of times you have to make sure, myself, I have to make sure I, you know, bundled up 
even though, you know, I go from my car to my bus, uh, bundled up just because there's times there was a couple of times I had very little heat in the bus and you kind of, the bus only has, uh, the city only has so many buses that you can bring out. Right. So, I mean, if there's 55 buses that don't have really good heat and they all need changed, uh, changed over, you kind of got to, they don't have a lot of that on their fleet, right? So there was a lot of buses that did not have any heat. So you kind of just got to suck it up for like a half an hour or so until they can kind of get you a new bus. But, and when it comes to the people in general, that's one time where I, it didn't matter to me where people were trying to get on the bus. I was just stopping pretty much anywhere I could just to make sure that they do get on because that's the one thing I, I, I felt horrible for the people that had to wait outside for a bus at the, in that weather. Education is shifting in Alberta. Teachers are the very backbone of knowledge and one of the keys to our future. There's nobody better to speak on the importance of the education system than the Greater St. Albert Elementary School teacher, Ian Tucky. Sydney Jones discusses the teacher's perspective on the shift and how it has helped kids grow with their education. Uh, as it stands, I am a supply educator for both St. Albert Public and Edmonton Public School Board. When did you decide this would be the profession you'd like to pursue? When I was coming out of high school, I made a tough decision between do I want to pursue education or do I want to pursue law? And at the time, I had a scholarship that allowed me to pursue law, so I chose to go up the path of least resistance. And I carried through on that all the way up until COVID, when I ended up leaving what I was doing in public relations at the time and returned back to kind of a desk post off the front line. Went back from there pretty much and, and reflected on my high school self and, and now started climbing kind of this other path. Why are you passionate about teaching? It is part of everything I do every single day. So for me, it's all about the kids and it's super exciting to work with the kids. I have a love of learning and I think that's a big part of it too because just as much as they're learning something every day, I'm learning something. But equally, just to kind of see that aha moment in a kid's life where they've figured something out, that's, that's gold. As an educator, what do you feel is the most important topic that you teach to your kids? Two thoughts here. One would be there's the academic side of things that we teach, and then there's like the life skill side of things that we teach. On the academic side, certainly like literacy, which is a, a big one that I champion, that's incredibly important, especially in a, a modern technological society. On the other side of the coin, though, you can't necessarily teach students street smarts per se, but you can give them the hard and soft skills that they need to make more informed decisions or more tailored decisions that lean into their needs so that they can continue to pursue things they want to do in a more effective manner. So between those two pillars, I think that's really important. But a lot of what I teach really depends on each individual student and what their interests are and how I can really make things work for them. How has your experience as a teacher reflected how you were taught as a youth? Certainly the way things are done now, I, I feel are more student-centered than they were when I was younger. And I think that's really important. So just like we were talking about student interest, it's an opportunity to actually get to know your students, build those relationships and use those relationships to help them learn and kind of create the right amount of challenge so that they can continue to be challenged enough that they grow, but not so over-challenged or under-challenged that they, they stagnate. When I was a kid, we still had quite a lot of behavioral or behavioralist approaches to school. So it was very much here are the notes, copy them down, learn it. Here are the next set of notes, copy them down, learn it. And so in that change, less teacher centered, we would say, you know, not so much sage on the stage, but now guide on the side. I think that's a really significant change, but I also feel that it's to the benefit of all parties. Reflecting on what has occurred in the last few years with political crisis and COVID-19, how would you say it has affected education? This is a big one. Moving everything online as we did during COVID made things incredibly difficult for students. Some just do not learn in an online means. And so we're seeing kids in the system now that are one to two grades behind where they should be. And in terms of their education, then as teachers, we spend a lot of time scaffolding and going backwards in time to teach them up to grade level if we can. And so the kind of the going thought is even if we can get them to shift one grade level up, we're still kind of moving them in the right direction. If we can get them caught all the way up, then that's incredible. The other big thing that came out uh, during COVID-19, of course, was the curricular change and trying to teach kids who are learning in an unfamiliar environment with one leg in the old curriculum and the other in the new curriculum certainly did not make things easy on the students, even more so than the teachers, because a great example is some of the work that I was working with in my grade five class was previously grade seven material. So there is a two, three year gap between what they're expected to know in addition to the COVID gap. So it's a lot of hard work for students in the classroom right now. Along the same line, how has these situations affected your job as an educator? 
So a lot more out of school time is being dedicated to creating lessons that fill that gap. Certainly, as an elementary generalist, you've got all subjects to, to account for. So and I, I won't speak to the other side because I imagine it's just as busy in high school. But bringing a student up four years in English and then bringing a student up four years in math or, or whatever the case may be, it takes a lot of time. So it's almost like I work a full-time job during the day and then a full-time job during the night preparing for the next day's run of stuff. So the biggest challenge there probably is work-life balance. Do you have anything else to add about your profession? I would say that I am glad I have the life experience that I do and that I waited until I did to move into education, but I'm glad I didn't wait too long. It is a truly enjoyable profession. It is a noble profession. And it's not really work if you go in as a teacher every day just to have fun and experience the learning as much as the kids are. In terms of the profession, it is a wonderful place full of wonderful people, all working very, very hard to do what's best for our society and, and prepare the next generation for it. I would challenge anyone who's interested in the profession to really take up the charge. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me today. With the emergence of 3D sound technology, it is now possible to deliver sound to the listener's ears in a more immersive way. Brooklyn Le Session interviews Poirig Butner Schneer, musician and audio engineer, to discuss how further research can lead to even better sound experiences. My name is Poirig Butner Schneer. I'm an assistant professor in the music department. I teach sound recording and music production. My background, I Started with performance, so I did my undergraduate degree in jazz performance at McGill University. I played trumpet, and I ended up doing a master's degree in music production also at McGill University. And when I graduated from that, I freelanced for about 10 years in Montreal, just working at various studios and working in um, with all kinds of different types of music as a freelance producer and uh, recording engineer. I'm just going to get you to explain a little bit about what Dolby Atmos is. Dolby Atmos is an immersive audio format. And just to kind of explain what that means, most of us are used to hearing music in stereo, which means there's two channels, a left and a right. So if you think of headphones, there's a left channel and a right channel, that which go over each ear. And before that, there was mono when there was only one channel of audio. Most music is consumed in stereo and has been that way for a long time. But there are other uh, formats that have multi-channels. So for example, there's 5.1 and 7.1, and those are common types of uh, surround sound or immersive audio formats. And what that means, basically, the 5 in 5.1 stands for five speakers, and the 0.1 means one subwoofer. And then if it's 7.1, that means seven speakers and one subwoofer. And those speakers traditionally would just be surrounding the listener. So you would be surrounded by five speakers if it was 5.1 or seven speakers if it was 7.1. And what that means is if you're sitting in the right spot in a room with those five speakers, you can kind of put sounds all around the listener and it's really um, immersive. And that's why it's called uh, surround sound or immersive audio. And when you go to the movies, for example, the theaters will probably be in 5.1 or 7.1, at least in the past they would be. And that they might have way more speakers than that, but they're still configured in that kind of 5.1 or 7.1 format. But what Dolby Atmos is, it's a, a newer type of immersive format, and they've actually taken that 7.1 setup, so seven speakers around the listener, um, but they've also added height channels. So now there's speakers suspended above the listener, and usually it's about four speakers. So Dolby Atmos can be called a 7.1.4 setup. Sometimes I use two subwoofers, so it could be 7.2.4. So <laughs> all that to say, the idea is that you're surrounding the listener with speakers so that they can experience the music in a more realistic type of way because they've got the ability to put sounds all around the listener. So that's kind of what uh, Dolby Atmos is. I see that lots of albums and streaming services are starting to use Dolby Atmos. What does this technology mean for the music industry? It's it's really interesting because with those traditional surround sound formats, and again, sorry to say 5.1 and 7.1 a million times, but with those formats, you needed five speakers uh, for it to work, right? You had to be in a room surrounded by five speakers, or if it was 7.1, surrounded by seven speakers and a subwoofer. But one of the things that makes Dolby Atmos innovative and I guess is really meaningful for the music industry right now is that it, they've uh, built into it the ability to kind of translate to the various different setups that people might have. So for example, not everyone at home has 5.1 speakers or 7.1 speakers. A lot of people listen on headphones. So Dolby Atmos can be created for the like kind of optimized amount of speakers, 
but it's built into the software that it will also be able to just using the right algorithms kind of make different, I guess, types of mixes for different playback systems. So for example, they use what's called binaural technology to make it work on headphones as well. So obviously headphones only have two speakers, one on each ear. And the Dolby Atmos uh, codec is able to kind of output audio in a way that when you're listening on headphones, it should translate more or less to what was intended. I think the thing that really makes it innovative is how well it translates across all the different playback systems, which before with different immersive audio formats, that wasn't the case. So, so that's kind of why it's kind of the new buzzword in the audio world is because it's supposed to be something that everybody can experience and not just people who own the right amount of speakers. Do you think that that was something that you could incorporate into your own music production? Yeah, sure. So like a lot of the um, the record labels and big artists and um, lots of musicians out there right now are asking for Atmos mixes because it's kind of the new interesting audio format. And so um, for sure, I've been doing some some Atmos recording and mixing myself. Um, it's something we've been looking at in our classes uh, as well. We've done a, a few uh, kind of introductory kind of um, I guess, uh, workshops about Atmos mixing and Atmos recording. But for music, it's a little bit different. And I think the challenge is how do you use this technology to to surround the listener with sound without getting gimmicky? With all the power of how you can make sounds move around the listener, is there a way to do that without it feeling gimmicky? How can we take this technology for music and make it use it to its full advantage while still not making it cheesy or gimmicky? Thanks for joining us on The Relevance Report. This week's episode was produced by Darby Crouch, Garrett Krasinowski, Sydney Jones, and Brooklyn Lestyshin. The show was edited by Brooklyn, and the show's supervising producer is Sheena Rossiter. Additional studio supervision was by Sasha Stibenich. The show was edited and produced out of the McEwen Media Studio. Our theme music is Buzzing by Kaylee Lambert, and additional music was new logo intro by Breck Studios from Pixabay. Logo design for this podcast is by Stasha Stoinovich, and I'm Darby Crouch, your host for this week's episode. This podcast was recorded on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of Cree, Diné, Blackfoot, Soto, and Nakota Sioux. We acknowledge this territory is home to the Métis settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta's Region 2, 3, and 4 within the historical Northwest Métis homeland. Don't forget to subscribe to The Relevance Report on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you heard, please leave us a review and rating. It really helps people find the show. Please join us again next week when we report on relevant stories that are shaping our world.